I just want to make a quick follow-up video um, to talk about maybe a couple more things that Shifification um, allows us to do now. Well, and, and some of this is going to be about things we don't even necessarily need Shifification for, but um, first, I also want to mention that that part of what got me off my butt to finally make more of these videos recently is, well, one, being done with my candidacy, uh, but that was back in December. Um, and the other is that, you know, I received a very nice email from someone who I uh, assume is a subscriber, but at least is a fan, and they had some kind words, and I was like, okay, I guess um, I guess I gotta make another video um, for the fans. So here's two videos back to back. Maybe I'll publish this the same day. Maybe I'll draw it out for the algorithm or something. Um, but let's get into it. So what do I want to tell you about now that we've done some chiefification? We've looked at an example. Probably for completeness, I should go back and talk about... Um, you know, our original example of the continuous and bounded functions versus bounded functions. Um, maybe we'll do that. Um, but one thing I want to say is that now we have um, some cool ways to relate sheaves, right? So, so remember that for us, um, a sheaf F is going from the open sets right? It's taking open sets of our topological space and it's spitting out, um, I guess in this case, commutative rings with identity. So uh, if you want to, if you want to be slick, I guess this is the way to write it. Um, uh, Kring. And um, moreover, you know, we already talked about the fact that actually these two things are categories and, and our sheaves are, are functors. You know, that's kind of the, the fancy way to do it, uh, uh, to say it. But now we should be asking ourselves, right? We've got, we're assigning these ring-like objects. Well, I mean, we're literally assigning rings to every open set, right? So it's very natural to ask, um, okay, things that I can do with rings, can I do this with, with sheaves? valued in rings, right? Or, uh, I mean, I also said one possible perspective is to, you know, view this as sheaves valued in abelian groups or what have you, right? So like, what are natural things we can do with rings? Well, we have, um, or or with groups, with abelian groups. Let's, let's think about the group example, actually. It's, you know, maybe even general, um, but even nicer, right? So, so if we think about abelian groups, then, um, well, what do we, what are some of our operations on groups, right? Like I can do stuff like if I have two groups, A and B, I can form their uh, direct sum, which is the same thing as their, as their direct product, right? Um, what else can I do? Well, I can also have sub objects, right? Like I have a subgroup of a group and um, in the case where it's abelian, you know, I don't need to worry about normal stuff, right? Uh, and having normal subgroups, so I can just take quotients by all of my subobjects. And uh, what else do I have? Well, I have homomorphisms between groups, right? And we've talked about homomorphisms between sheaves. So what are some of the basic things that we do? You know, like to understand a homomorphism of a group, right? It, my opinion, this is probably a common opinion, what does it mean to understand a homomorphism? Well, I think there's really two things you need to write down, the kernel and the image. Uh, there's more to it than that, right? You can, you can have non-equal homomorphisms with same uh, kernel and image, right? But, but this really helps you get a grip on, on the general structure of a homomorphism, right? So we have things like images, and we have things like kernels, um, and there's even stuff called co-kernels, which is is maybe um, maybe you're not familiar with that, depending on how much uh, higher level algebra you've had uh, before watching these videos. Okay, so it's very natural then to ask, can we make sense of these things for sheaves? And the answer is yes. 
yes, we can do all of these operations in sheaves, right? Um, but here's where sheafification comes into play. So for instance, um, imagine I have F, uh, or maybe let's use, I don't know, I'm following Hatcher a bit right now. I think he uses phi, nice fancy notation for a morphism of our sheaves. And remember that we can just think about, you know, sort of a low level thing that these are sheaves and here's a morphism, but we could also think about the fact that these sheaves are functors and uh, phi is a natural transformation of functors, right? So we have these different ways um, of thinking about this available to us and it can be beneficial um, to, to have both of them and flip between these different viewpoints, right? So, you know, let's guess, what could we possibly define uh, the kernel of this to be, right? What, what should we have the kernel be? Well, remember that for um, the datum of a uh, morphism of sheaves is first and foremost for each open set, right? So these are both, you know, I'm imagining my space X, these are both sheaves on, this, on the space X. Um, it provides me with a let's say homomorphism of abelian groups of the space of se sections, right? In a way that's compatible with the restriction maps, right? That, that, that's the datum of it being a natural transformation, et cetera. So this is itself uh, a homomorphism of, of, of abelian groups. So if I wanted to define at least some sort of uh, kernel pre-sheaf, well, what should I, uh, so, so the kernel, what should the, uh, I, I sort of just spoiled it here already. So um, if I want to define first, at least the kernel pre-sheaf um, at phi, what should it be at u? Well, I'll just define it to be the kernel of this homomorphism over you. And it turns out, um, oh, should I do the proof now? I didn't, I didn't practice the proof ahead of time. And it'd be very embarrassing to get it wrong, even though it's a simple proof. So I'm going to leave it as a challenge to you. And then I'll promise to do it uh, in the next video. That's my, that's my cover story. Uh, so I claim that this actually is a bona fide sheaf. Right? So uh, by simply making this assignment, and um, so the trick I would use, I think I mentioned this in an earlier video, right? There's, there's the, um, there's sort of two ways to look at the gluing condition um, of a sheaf, right? There's, there's the one where if you had, you know, two sections um, that, uh, if, you know, if they're, if they're restriction to, you have some open cover UI, and if you have two sections, S and T, and if their restriction uh, to every piece of the open cover um, is, is are equal, then the original global sections themselves must be equal, right? That that was um, our, our restriction property of the sheaves, right? Um, but there was another there was another way to frame this, right? I think I already discussed this in a video, which is to say that. Um, uh, if the restriction of S is uh, zero, right? It's the it's the uh, zero element of your uh, sheaf of uh, uh, abelian groups for all uh, you. Then S itself um, must have been uh, zero as a global section of the sheaf, right? So these were two equivalent ways to frame the restriction condition of the sheaf. Um, but I would argue, I mean, it's not really that big of a deal, but I would argue that this perspective on that condition is, you know, slightly more um, useful for convincing yourself that this uh, really is a sheaf. But why is sheafification useful here? If that's, you know, this pre-sheaf we defined already as a sheaf. Well, you should suspect that uh, one of these things um, is not a sheaf, right? So the other sort of straightforward thing that we might do, of course, is in trying to define, you know, the image, the image pre-sheaf, 
associated to this open set. Um, of course, in the same vein, we would just define it as the image of phi restricted to you, right? But I claim that this in general, it, you know, so if you take this, it could accidentally um, end up being a sheaf. It will be a pre-sheaf. I guarantee you this. Um, go ahead and, and, and prove it. Maybe I'll do it in, in the next episode. Um, but in general, it is not going to be a um, an actual sheaf. And the pro the thing that goes wrong, uh, let me see, you know, this is a Sunday afternoon. I'm just, I'm just popping off some videos at random here. So, so the classic example, let's see if I get this straight, is if we think about the topological space um, of the complex numbers. And um, if we, if we think about um, our sheaf, well, we could have a, we could have a morphism of say the, the holomorphic, the sheaf of holomorphic functions to the sheaf of holomorphic functions. And uh, we could have as our uh, homomorphism the exponential map, right? So this just sends you know, some holomorphic function to exp of some holomorphic function. And uh, if we just try looking at the image, right? So, so the image of this map, Right, the image should be all the functions that can um, that can be written as some exponential. But the thing that goes wrong here with the sheaf condition is let's think about so um, I, I, this example does you know depend on you having some complex geometry in your background. So I apologize if you don't. Um, but that's, you know, if we're going to really get into doing some manifolds and algebraic geometry later in the series, then that's a good thing for you to have anyways. So let's think about, you know, here's an open set in the complex numbers, right? The non-zero complex numbers. And let's just think about a very simple function. Uh, the function, you know, f of z equals uh, to z, right? The problem is, is that so so locally, any over any of these, like if I have some little patch here, right, um, I can find a solution, right? I can I can write this as the exponential of some other function, right? But the problem is, remember that our um, you know it depends what branch we're choosing, but remember that the the logarithm because it, it, essentially what we're doing is, is you know to see that this map is. Um, to try and find its, you know, if you're going to find its surjective or something, right? You, you'd want to be taking complex logs. Um, the the we we don't have it's it's not a continuously defined um, uh, everywhere in the complex plane, right? We have to make this this branch cut somewhere. So we could take some open cover, right? And on all these little patches, right? I can always write this function as um, as the exponential of, of something, right? But the problem is I can't glue this up to a global function because I don't, there is no, there is no, um, you know, G holomorphic on all of C such that uh, exp of G is just the constant function. So um, again, this is I know just a just a, a sort of hand wavy Sunday afternoon example, um, but here is a reason why sheafification is uh, so useful because we you know we might be sad we might have thought oh you know our category of abelian groups is so nice it's an abelian category not a big deal if you don't know what that means right now we'll talk about it um and so you might have thought oh yeah i want i want to do all of these operations we talked about at the beginning of the video and you know do all these things that we can do with abelian groups and then you know you check the kernel you say oh yay the kernel works great that's a sheaf um but then you go and you check the image you know like that's a basic thing should be a sheaf and it's not because of this example however here's the fix here's the fix of course it is a pre-sheaf still so what i'm going to do is define 
the image, um, the image sheaf instead to not be, of course, just this pre sheaf, the image um, um, pre sheaf, but rather, uh, let me write it this way. I will define this to be the sheafification of the sheaf that sends you uh, to the image, the pre-sheaf that sends you to the image of each of these five. And so now this is why you see, so if you if you crack open um, whatever textbook you might be reading or following on sheaves, you might see sometimes, oh yeah, it, you know, we define the kernel just however, um, but the image gets sheafified or, or there's, you know, I think maybe when we try and define the, the tensor product of, you know, sheaves of vector spaces or something, um, we, uh, I'm pretty sure in that case too, we need a sheafification. So it's really, really nice because actually now that we have sheafification, um, it allows us, it allows us to recover all of these objects. Okay. Um, that's all I wanted to say on this topic, um, on the next video. So I guess we'll get back into examples soon. Thanks again for watching.